you can start. All right, so welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure and actually an honor to be uh, presenting on probability to, to everyone here, because I know we have a variety of backgrounds and um, anyway, it's just real, real, uh, real good opportunity to present on probability. I find it super fascinating and I wanted to polish up on it. Uh, so I was happy to, to jump in and, and, and present this week on, on this. Um, the slides are from our, our good man, Josh. I love this layout. I think we've seen it all over the place. So thanks again for that. Uh, all right, so we're gonna go over probability. This is gonna um, be an introduction refresher. And I know we talked about, um, we'll have lots of good questions. I think everyone's at various stages of ability with statistics. So we can jump into some of the uh, deeper topics I saw posted in the, in the thread towards the end. Um, this is uh, going over probability models and axioms and then jumping into conditioning and Bayes rule. Uh, and there's one exercise I, I brought in Mike's uh, question because I think that's a good um, exercise for setting up a, um, the right mindset for thinking about probability problems. So I brought that in as well. So thanks for posting that in there, Mike. And then I referenced uh, MIT's introduction to probability, like they have a bunch of notes um, they're really good and it, it gave a kind of a coherent flow to talking about probability. Not that um, the course notes from BBR weren't coherent, but you know, he's kind of, uh, he, he, I, anyway, his style is great. So, but this just gave me a little more structure. So I referenced it a lot. Okay, so probability models. I like that um, framing of probability, like it's a model. It's a, it's a framework for thinking about problems, for thinking about experience. Um, there's lots of ways to slice and dice things we see, and probability gives us a set of tools for thinking critically and um, scientifically about uh, uncertainty. And then axioms are just the rules that um, help us play the game in a uh, consistent manner. So we're going to go over both of those ideas. So the big question is, what is probability? And I guess it is kind of a um, philosophical question. There's a lot of, uh, apparently, I'm not a statistician, so I, I can't speak to the different debates, but it, it, it can be a little um, philosophical, right? So what is probability? Is it a frequency? Is it a belief? Is it a betting preference? And I think all the use cases there are are relevant. The, um, an analogy that helps me think about probability is actually list columns. So one thing I like to consider is on any observation, you're seeing a value or a series of values if you have multiple columns, um, but that value is coming from a bunch of potential values, right? And that, that, um, that idea of potential is where you get the the probability, what did you see and why did you see it? Was it the most frequently seen, that you, the most frequent value that you would have seen there? Is it just an outlier? So you start, you, I think that idea is, is powerful for kind of thinking about probability is, is there's a, a nested population of values that you are observing a single example from. And then why did you see that? We get, is where the analysis comes in. So I used the, I, I didn't, I don't remember if we used penguins or not. I thought we did. So I, I pulled it in. And yeah, it's the, it's the official data set for. Okay. The course. <laughs> I mean, this is the only thing I do with it. And just because I wanted to give an example to the idea. So um, here we just take the penguins data set, nest it um, in a list column, and then pluck out a value from. Uh, uh, body mass, so we're observing one random value from uh, the uh, body mass in grams of penguins, right? So um, a lot of interesting questions can come up like, was that, would that be the average value that we'd expect to see? You know, what's, what's going on there? And so then you could, you could think, well, let me just 
put this in a for loop and collect more and more values from this underlying population and you start building up uh, a sense of the distribution and and you're, you can start inferring what that underlying population is now in our case we uh, know what the data set is but that is effectively what what we're doing when we take a sample from from uh, those islands in this case right so we're taking a, a just a, a snapshot of that population and then inferring about it so I really like that analogy to list columns. I think it's, it helps me anyway with the intuition behind it. And uh, another thing that I thought was really fun about putting this together is I use a lot of Greek symbols. That's kind of uh, new to my repertoire. So you'll see that scattered in. I was playing around with that stuff. But so the sample space which is that, I think it's called a uh, omega or something like that. I shouldn't use it if I can't remember what it is, but that fancy little symbol, the shoehorn. So the sample space is what we are observing a value from. And there are um, possible outcomes that can be observed at any given moment. And we tend to develop uh, a perception of a likelihood of seeing certain things. And so that's where um, a lot of the inference and um, that's the, I mean, that's the primary challenge is are we accurately representing the, uh, the population we're, we're inferring on? So that is the, the analogy that I think works for me anyway, and hopefully for, for others. And we'll kind of come back to that as we tie things together. All right, so in terms of the rules for the game, right? So um, probability, it definitely is structured. It may be philosophical, like the exact meaning, like is it, a long run frequency is it just a belief like he uses an example of um, um president presidential elections like you don't have long run frequencies for the upcoming election but we can speak to the probability of candidate a or candidate b so um that all that may be debatable like what are the, the implications of it but there are, are set rules and so those are that um it's between zero and one is is um, the two big ones. So there's non-negativity, which means that your probabilities are greater than zero. And then normalization means it's always condensed within a range of zero to one. Um, and then there's this other um, clause, finite additivity. And so that's saying if you subset A and B, and if that subset's uh, null, then um, like it's empty, empty set, then you can uh, just take the um, probabilities of each. And the way I think of that one, so like really, because probability is standardized and it's, you don't have a, you, you lose sense of the actual counts, right? So, um, but in terms of just thinking of counts, if you have uh, rows with A and rows with B and there's no duplication, then you can just append those two. And you've got uh, the number of rows um, overall. Whereas if they have duplication and you append, if you use like C bind and you append them together um, and there's duplicates, then you'd overcount what the actual number of observations is. And so you have to remove the duplicates. And there's um, SQL has union. And so there's analogies to this um, additivity concept that I think are a little more um, tangible, but we've, we abstract the counts away uh, so these things are easier to uh, compute. And then, but it makes it a little more abstract, but that's what that's saying. So if the intersection is, is empty, then you can just add the two together. Oh yeah, so what's the relatable pattern? So if, uh, and, uh, you see this a lot um, to standardize a, a distribution, like if you, if you were to just count, um, count penguins by gender or something, I don't know. Um, and you wanted to then standardize that, you can just do the count divided by the overall count. And now you've got the values on a uh, zero to one scale and that could represent their um, probability within that data set, right? So you would then have to infer what, what that means for the overall population, but um, n divided by sum of n is a way of standardizing, normalizing. 
And then what about an analogy to help additivity? Yeah, and so this is the um, this is the appending rows together. If you have duplicate rows, you need to remove them. If there's no duplicates, then you're good. Union will take care of that for you in MySQL. I said all that. So um, yeah, if there's questions on this stuff, go ahead. But I feel like um, those are two pretty straightforward and intuitive ways of thinking about um, normalization and additivity. All right, so what are the consequences of these rules, these axioms? So here we have the probability of A plus the probability of not A. So if you do a, a, a check and you're like, give me the mean of uh, where X equals some value and, and then you do that, give me the mean where it's not equal to some value and you add those together, it's always gonna be one. So that, that has to be the case and that's um, a, a consequence of it. So. Um, the, the condition being true and the condition being false, um, total to one. Um, if, it, if A is a subset of B, like if, it, like if you group on B and that, or if you group on a, a bunch of things and you only, and, and B happens to be one of the groups and A only exists in B, then A's, the probability of A is going to be less than the probability of B. Um, and I think that's just intuitive because it exists conditional on it being in B and only in B. Um, that's my interpretation of that one. Uh, so if you get the union of A and B, okay, so this is the case where, you, you know, you're just being cautious. You're, you're removing uh, any duplication. Because um, if you didn't and there was duplication, then you would uh, overcount. You don't want to do that, right? Because it's effectively all counting. And then you've got A union of B. Okay, so given that you remove, so in all cases you remove. If you're talking about the union of A and B, you've removed any duplication. So given you've removed the duplication, A, A union B is gonna be less than or equal to um, the probability of A plus the probability of B, which just goes back to that additivity um, point. So for the union of A and B and C, what you're doing is you're taking probability of A plus the um, probability of not A um, intersect with B, so, so B without A, um, plus the probability of C without A or B. All right, so remove, any, remove A from B's probability, remove uh, A and B from C's probability, and, and when you do that, you get the um, total probability of A union B union C. It's a mouthful. Any questions about these consequences? Or any interesting thoughts on it? I don't know. I, I think it's I'm pretty clear what, what those implications are and how they relate to analyzing data. All right, so now we're at conditioning and Bayesville. So conditioning is super fascinating. Um, I think the big idea with conditioning is you've, you're grouping and then you're taking a proportion within that group. So you've kind of lost the sense of the overall, um, we'll, we'll use the data set in this case, you've lost the sense of the overall data set um, because you've taken a proportion within the group. Um, and, and that's a pretty common pattern is group by and, and um, taking proportions. And that is conditional probability and then uh, the rules you learn are, are ways of working back out to the overall um, probability from the conditional probability from that group probability. So in the, for the, the symbols, you've got the probability of A given B. So that P uh, straight line B, I think that is the pipe, but um, P A given B. So you, so you group it on B and then you're taking the proportion of A, um, which is the probability of A given B. And then you have the um, entire formula where you're saying the probability of the intersection of A and B divided by the, the total probability of B. And so, so that intersection of A and B is just A exists by this much within, within B and B is this many rows is a way of thinking of that. So 
the, the total number. And it doesn't have, to, I don't think you want to necessarily restrict your understanding of probability to finite rows of in a data set, but because um, it's powerful to be able to abstract all that away, but and just to drive home the intuition for, uh, for it, I find that useful. Um, so it is the proportion of, of a group down B is your, is your conditional probability. Uh, so what's the intuition for this? And it's probably just what I just said. Yeah, so it is just like uh, grouping on B and calculating the proportion of A. Um, all right, so this is now, okay, so we've got our conditional, we've got our, our, our proportion within, within the group, but how do we get back out to um, but just the probability of this intersection overall. Um, and that is this formula. So the intersection of A and B uh, equals, and this is where you, you, you can see some, some weighting. So you almost use the, um, the probability of B as a weight to adjust your proportion of A within B. Um, and that's what this is, is telling you. And you can reverse that logic so you can say, uh, what's my probability of A overall as the weight to adjust my um, the conditional probability of, of B given A? Um, and, and weights are super common in, in an analysis. Linear models give us weights. I think, I think these ideas pop up all over the place. Um, well, probability is kind of foundational. So it makes sense that it does that. So you get your, um, your overall probability of that intersection by taking by applying the weight of, of the, um, the group you're using there, the probability of B. Okay, so this is the total probability theorem. We're gonna talk about that real quick. Um, and is there a chat? I don't know. I don't know, let me see if there's, there's chats. Oh, nice. Big Omega, yeah. <laughs> okay, good, so there's Omega. Um, so what is the total probability theorem? All right, so this is, this is interesting, right? So we're talking about grouping on, uh, on A and getting the proportion of B within A. So then you can think of all the different possible groups. So AI is like, um, like if it's um, island, yeah, I think we have like three islands. So AI would be first island, AI two would be the second island, AI three. So if you take all your, so you're just running, you're iterating that weighting. So you're taking the ith island, the first island and the conditional pro and the, and the proportion of B within that island plus the second island and the proportion uh, within that island times the probability of that island and, and the third one. So it's like this iterative uh, cycle. And if you do that, you will eventually get to the total probability of B, right? Because you've taken the proportion of B within A, uh, within all the different groups, weighted by um, the probability of, of the, well, really the proportion of A overall of each group uh, within A. Uh, overall and summon those all together and you get your your total probability and I don't know if that's that that's not the most intuitive for me but I mean it makes sense I just wouldn't know how to apply it um, strategically as a concept if I'm analyzing something but I, I think that's I mean it's clear what, what it's doing um, and this leads us but this is like a big idea within Bayes and this is why getting an intuition for, for that total probability theorem, I think is critical for really um, thinking critically about that analysis and what we're doing. Um, so with Bayes rule, so Bayes rule, you're taking a conditional probability. So you're taking the, the proportion of A within B, the probability of A given B, um, and that is uh, equal to the, it's, it's what we've been saying, right? So it's the probability of A times the probability of B uh, given A divided by 
the overall probability of B. Yeah, so this is super powerful stuff. And um, we're gonna compare it now to the conditional probability formula, because I think, I mean, they're obviously saying the same thing, but this, but Bayes is, is taking that intersection and instead of just saying, okay, so um, the probability of, of A intersecting B is the uh, probability of A weighting the probability of B given A. So that tweak there is, is where you, um, you because what they'll do is they'll then start playing around with the probability of A as your, as your prior, and you can um, update stuff. And I don't have experience doing that. That video that someone posted was really, really good at, at, at describing that. But it was like a fleeting sort of good, so I've lost that thread already. Um, but this then brings us to the big picture. And I don't know how I'm doing that. Okay, so the big picture, going back to um, the, uh, the nested column, because what we've, and I think this, so what the, the intuition there, or the, the big picture is, um, and this is where bootstrapping comes in, like all these powerful methods that we have for taking observed data and creating our own uh, distributions that we can sample from, um, whether it's bootstrap or it's, um, um, I'm on the spot, so I'm forgetting what it is. Juan Roman, what's the what's the other one? Man, you're supposed to be my wingman when I when I come up. So you got Bootstrap is the main main one, and then there's one where you you don't leave one out, but it's Jackknife. There's Jackknife, yeah. There's Jackknife, and then really related to Jackknife, kind of the more modern version of Jackknife. Oh. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank also. Yeah, it'll come to us. It's it's super common. I mean, Sylvia just um, Sylvia. What's her first name? I'm, I'm not nervous, guys. I promise. But I'm drawing blanks. Um, she just did a uh, a tidy Tuesday, and she used this uh, approach for um, for sampling. Anyway, so there's so the idea there is is we can we can create distributions ourselves so um and that's super powerful and and even i think as we go on and, and learn more from the good professor of uh, of this uh harold professor harold is he even talks about yeah so we've got all these um okay i think we might get an answer here oh, I just, all right so um, he, he says we have all these package distributions that, that are go-to, right? So the normal distribution, um, beta, and there's, and there's a bunch, and, and they're super useful. I, I think we've worked out the, the rules of the game for those, and, and it just gives us a, a good way of, of contrasting what we're seeing to theoretical distributions that can give us a sense of performance. So those are... Those are really good, but we have computational tools at our disposal to create our own distributions as well, based on the empirical data that we that we're observing in the moment. And that is, uh, I think that's liberating. I think that's becoming more and more prevalent. And um, yeah, so I think that that, that idea is um, is powerful that we can. Um, and, and it's, it's fascinating. So I, I'm, I'm, I've been in um, travel industry and now I'm in uh, healthcare. But a lot of it is um, performance, like contrasting. Like, year over, like, how are we doing? Well, we'll look at like year over year. Or we'll look at week over week. And these statisticians, they're like, well, how are we doing based on what we're seeing? And they come up with these theoretical distributions to then use as a contrast. I mean, and this is before computers. I mean, it just blows my mind the the problems these guys were solving. But a lot of it is that that kind of like give us a critical context to understand if what we're seeing is meaningful or not. So it's like they were doing KPIs, you know, 
back in back in the day and now we can build this stuff up with uh, um, bootstrapped iterations and, and nested columns and running models all over the place and so this is just I think the big picture is um, um, well that's the big picture right we, we got a, we got a toolkit and probability is a powerful framework for for thinking about how we analyze and and um, yeah it's good stuff so we'll, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more um, from this course on thinking critically about which models to to use and 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 so on because this guy Harold he's Professor Harold he seems to be on the cutting edge of um, statistical innovation he talks about um, Bayesian approach and so on so um, I think that's really cool so that is the big picture and now we're going to look at um, the we're going to do a quick exercise so this was uh, posted in slack you probably all figured it out by now but I think it'll be useful to, to walk through it because even after having like prepared all this, I looked at it and I was like, oh, that's, that's, I had to think about it. So in this case, we have a, a test developed um, for a disease, right? And this disease affects one out of every thousand people. So um, we're testing for this disease. Uh, the test 99% accurate at detecting someone uh, with the disease and 99% accurate at detecting that someone without the disease is negative. So it's super accurate. Um, you're given the test and you've tested positive, what's the probability that you have the disease? Right, so the uh, super accurate test, the disease is affecting one out of every thousand people, you've gotten the positive test results, oh no. What do you do? What do you, how do you feel about that? And um, the video that was posted was really, um, it, it was a similar scenario. And it was super, what, and we'll go through the how to solve this, and then I'm, I'll leave it open to discussion. But it, um, the video was really good. So visit that video if you want an even more um, in-depth dive into this sort of problem, this sort of thinking. And so the, the catch here is that one out of a thousand Right, so if you think about a data set and you've got 99% of, of people that are um, tested positive actually having the, no, 99% accuracy of detecting someone with the disease, but you've got um, a thousand, one out of a thousand. So that would be like, so one person sick out of a thousand, so 99%, so you'd need like, um, 100,000, right? So you could have a data set of 100,000 people, uh, 99 would be sick and, and the rest would be healthy. I mean, that's a super small amount. And so that, that just that disparity in, in the number of people that are sick and then 99%, and then you're still gonna miss that one, one person. But now you've got a 1% um, a of the uh, 99,000 people that are gonna be tested positive. And that number is just much bigger than the 99. Anyway, that was probably a terrible explanation there. So let's just walk through this thing. So um, test positive is TP. S is sick. H is healthy. Uh, the probability of uh, testing positive given, you're sick, given that you're sick is 99%. The probability of testing positive given that you're healthy is 1%. Uh, the probability of six, uh, sick is um, 0 0.001, so that's like what, one tenth of percent? And then the probability of being healthy is 0.999, right? So those are our variables that we're gonna use. And we wanna know um, out, of, out of that, there's the unknowns, and the unknown is the probability of being sick given you've tested positive, All right? So if we could um, understand this test positive, and, and get that probability, we'd, we'd be gold here. So let's get it. That's what Bates allows us to do. So the formula for um, this proportional, this um, conditional probability is what we've seen earlier. So we take the probability of being sick 
times the um, probability of testing positive given that you're sick divided by the probability of overall, right? So of all, all the rows out of this massive data set where um, we've tested positive, which is going to include the people that were sick and tested positive and the people that are healthy and tested positive, out of all those rows in our denominator, in the numerator, we're going to then say, um, given that you're sick and tested positive, how many times did that occur times the overall um, probability of being sick. And that, and then to get the um, probability, the, the overall probability of, um, of testing positive, we take uh, the probability of being sick times testing, the probability of testing positive given sick, plus the probability of being healthy, which is much larger, uh, times the probability of testing positive given healthy. And so that gives us our overall um, probability of testing positive. And here I plug it in and spit it out. So we have a, uh, well, so the total probability of testing positive was 1%. Probability of um, being sick, given you tested positive is only 9%, which is rather small. So that is an example of using um, Bayes' theory. And that is, that is all I have for, for this presentation. Uh, and thanks, Eric. Uh, Matt uh, Curcio was the one who uh, uh, linked to that video. And uh, if you haven't checked it out, I think it's it's worth it. I didn't even realize because I, I, I mentioned in the Slack that I'd seen this problem like 20 years ago and it always stuck with me. It was like so counterintuitive because as Eric says, you get a, a positive result back on a diagnostic test and a cold chill runs down your spine. Um, and it's particularly relevant these days uh, because of all the testing going on for coronavirus. Um, I have been watching with some degree of horror everything that's been going on in the past six months with regard to testing and with regard to the difficulty of interpreting testing results. And uh, if anybody follows sports like I do, I know Asma follows sports, I imagine some of you do, you get so many cases where somebody tests positive, they get holed up in a hotel for 48 hours, and then they test negative, and it's like, okay, all is good. Well, <laughs> wait a second. What, are, what, are, what conditions, what are, what are your conditional probabilities here? And what, what assumptions are you making? Um, and that's why I think an, a, a, an understanding of not only the use of Bayes' theorem, but a misuse of Bayes' theorem is often very informative. I, I think that uh, in the video, it's al also mentioned uh, how Bayes' theorem can be very useful to, uh, um, oh, there's the video. Okay, great. So I'll shut up. So I think I need to pipe in the audio, right? So there's a way to share audio. Share computer sound, there we go. morning and you feel a little bit sick. No particular symptoms, just not 100%. And so you go to the doctor and she also doesn't know what's going on with you, so she suggests they run a battery of tests. And after a week goes by, the results come back. Turns out you tested positive for a very rare disease that affects about 0.1% of the population. And it's a nasty disease, horrible consequences. You don't want it. So you ask the doctor, you know, how certain is it that I have this disease? And she says, well, the test will correct correctly identify 99% of people that have the disease and only incorrectly identify 1% of people who don't have the disease. So that sounds pretty bad. I mean, what are the chances that you actually have this disease? 
I think most people would say 99% because that's the accuracy of the test. But that is not actually correct. You need Bayes' theorem to get some perspective. Bayes' theorem can give you the probability that some hypothesis, say that you actually have the disease, is true given an event that you tested positive for the disease. To calculate this, you need to take the prior probability the hypothesis was true, that is, how likely you thought it was that you had this disease before you got the test results, and multiply it by the probability of the event given the hypothesis is true, that is, the probability that you would test positive if you had the disease, and then divide that by the total probability of the event occurring, that is, test positive. And this term is a combination of your probability of having the disease and correctly testing positive, plus your probability of not having the disease and being falsely identified. The prior probability that a hypothesis is true is often the hardest part of this equation to figure out, and sometimes it's no better than a guess. But in this case, a reasonable starting point is the frequency of the disease in the population, so 0.1%. And if you plug in the rest of the numbers, you find that you have a 9% chance of actually having the disease after testing positive. Which is incredibly low if you think about it. Now this isn't some sort of crazy magic. It's actually common sense applied to mathematics. Just think about a sample size of a thousand people. Now one person out of that thousand is likely to actually have the disease, and the test would likely identify them correctly as having the disease. But out of the 999 other people, one percent or ten people would falsely be identified as having the disease. So if you're one of those people who has a positive test result, and everyone's just selected at random, well, you're actually part of a group of 11 where only one person has the disease. So your chances of actually having it are 1 in 11, 9%. Could it just makes sense. The, could we pause when the, Bayes first um, came up with this theorem, he, he didn't actually for think a second. it was revolutionary. He didn't even think it was worthy of public. So if we, if we just go back a few seconds, if you can do that. Here, here we go. One more second back. Okay, so... so I also called this the base rate fallacy. Well, that's sort of a funny name. Basically, if you look at this picture, another name for the base rate fallacy is the false positive paradox. So here is the false positive paradox. And here's it's really easy to see. You have all these false positives, basically. And even though the test is correct in assuming that the patient actually has the disease, the paradox is, it's so, in, it, it, it gives too many false positives, basically. So it's inaccurate in giving the, the right proportions. So that's just another way to look at it, the false, pos, false positive paradox. Uh, I thought I'd add that. So it's important to me. It sort of makes, makes it make more sense, basically. Sorry, you can continue on. Thanks. Nice. Thanks for that part of a group of 11 where only one person has the disease. So your chances of actually having it are 1 in 11, 9%. It just makes sense. When Bayes first came up with this theorem, he didn't actually think it was revolutionary. He didn't even think it was worthy of publication. He didn't submit it to the Royal Society, of which he was a member. And in fact, it was discovered in his papers after he died, and he had abandoned it for more than a decade. His relatives asked his friend, Richard Price, to dig through his papers and see if there was anything worth publishing in there. And that's where Price discovered what we now know as the origins of Bayes' theorem. Bayes originally considered a thought experiment, where he was sitting with his back to a perfectly flat, perfectly square table, and then he would ask an assistant to throw a ball onto the table. Now this ball could obviously land and end up anywhere on the table, and he wanted to figure out where it was. So what he'd ask his assistant to do was throw on another ball and then tell him if it landed to the left or to the right or in front behind of the first ball. And he would note that down and then ask for more and more balls to be thrown on the table. What he realized was that... So what he's also explaining is a Bayes sort of search sort of system. So, so as you probably know, as you've probably heard, you know, the Coast Guard uses a Bayesian system. And when they were looking for the downed uh, a jet from uh, Thailand or something like that some, some time ago, they used a Bayesian system. So basically what that means is, you know, they're sort of knocking off 
the, the places that they've looked at with some probability and you know what's left of that if you throw the ball in a certain position and it's left of your known position then you've sort of ruled out that and the possibility of it being on the right is higher now so you know as you get more information you you sort of can hone in on you know where the plane or where the survivor actually is by sort of knowing where it's not and sort of looking at the probabilities of that. So that's another method for using Bayesian basically. And, and they don't necessarily have, you know, the, the guys on the boats figuring out the calculations, they have charts. So, you know, if you ask a guy, you know, how do you do that? Go, There's a chart <laughs> and it's all pre-figured out. And, you know, so it's, it's made simple. Sorry. Oh, don't be sorry, man, that's great. First ball. And he would note that down and then ask for more and more balls to be thrown on the table. What he realized was that through this method, he could keep updating his idea of where the first ball was. Now, of course, he would never be completely certain, but with each new piece of evidence, he would get more and more accurate. And that's how Bayes saw the world. It wasn't that he thought the world was not determined, that reality didn't quite exist, but it was that we couldn't know it perfectly. And all we could hope to do was update our understanding as more and more evidence became available. When Richard Price introduced Bayes' theorem, he made an analogy to a man coming out of a cave. Maybe he'd lived his whole life in there and he saw the sun rise for the first time and kind of thought to himself, is, is this a one-off? Is this a quirk? Or does the sun always do this? And then every day after that, as the sun rose again, he could get a little bit more confident that, well, that was the way the world works. So Bayes' theorem wasn't really a formula intended to be used just once. It was intended to be used multiple times, each time gaining new evidence and updating your probability that something is true. So if we go back to the first example, when you tested positive for a disease, what would happen if you went to another doctor, get a second opinion, and get that test run again, but let's say by a different lab, just to be sure that those tests are independent. And let's say that test also comes back as positive. Now, what is the probability that you actually have the disease? Well, you can use Bayes' formula again, except this time, for your prior probability that you have the disease, you have to put in the posterior probability, the, the probability that we were out before which is nine percent because you've already had one positive test and if you crunch those numbers the new probability based on two positive tests is 91 percent there's a 91 percent chance that you actually have the disease which kind of makes sense two positive results by different labs are unlikely to just be chance but you'll notice that probability is still not as high as the accuracy the reported accuracy of the test Bayes' theorem has found a number of practical applications, including notably filtering your spam. You know, traditional spam filters actually do a kind of bad job. There's too many false positives, too much of your email ends up in spam. But using a Bayesian filter, you can look at the various words that appear in emails and use Bayes' theorem to give a probability that the email is spam, given that those words appear. Now, Bayes' theorem tells us how to update our beliefs in light of new evidence, but it can't tell us how to set our prior beliefs. And so it's possible for some people to hold that certain things are true with 100% certainty, and other people to hold those same things are true with 0% certainty. What Bayes' theorem shows us is that in those cases, there is absolutely no evidence, nothing anyone could do to change their minds. And so as Nate Silver points out in his book, The Signal and the Noise, we should probably not have debates between people with 100% prior certainty and 0% prior certainty because, well, really, they'll never convince each other of anything. Most of the time when people talk about Bayes' theorem, they discuss how counterintuitive it is and how we don't really have an inbuilt sense of it. But recently my concern has been the opposite, that maybe we're too good at internalizing the thinking behind Bayes' theorem. And the reason I'm worried about that is because I think in life we can get used to particular circumstances. We can get used to results, maybe getting rejected or failing at something or uh, getting paid a low wage. And we can internalize that as though we are that man emerging from the cave and we see the sun rise every day and every day. And we keep updating our beliefs to 
uh, a point of near certainty that we think that that is basically the way that nature is. It's the way the world is and there's nothing that we can do to change it. You know, there's Nelson Mandela's quote that everything is impossible until it's done. And I think that is kind of a very Bayesian viewpoint on the world. If you have uh, no instances of something happening, then what is your prior for that event? It will seem completely impossible. Your prior may be zero until it actually happens. You know, the thing we forget in Bayes' theorem is that our actions play a role in determining outcomes and determining how true things actually are. But if we internalize that something is true and maybe we're 100% sure that it's true and there's nothing we can do to change it, well, then we're going to keep on doing the same thing and we're going to keep on getting the same result. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think a really good understanding of Bayes' theorem implies that experimentation is essential. If you've been doing the same thing for a long time and getting the same result that you're not necessarily happy with, maybe it's time to change. So is there something like that that you've been thinking about? If so, let me know in the comments. That is a great video. I especially like the idea of updating the, um, in, in the video we talked about P of H, but that, that the probability that you're weighting your conditional probability by, and I think that, and it doesn't, I, I'm not that experienced with, with, with Bayesian techniques, but it seems like a, they do like, run analysis with a bunch of different like that's like a tuning parameter and and then they get the um, the probability based on I don't know I, I, I'm reading this rethinking statistics book and, and he's doing some stuff in the first few chapters that's blowing my mind but it's just powerful when you think about in terms of weights and using your your domain knowledge to to help influence the uh, the analysis so that's probability, folks. I don't know what the probability of me giving a good presentation was, but you guys were a terrific audience. Thanks, Eric. If I could offer a comment uh, uh, after seeing the video, I think um, Bayes, uh, prob Bayesian probability can be very powerful, but also very dangerous. And we see its misapplication in day-to-day uh, -day, um, instances. And I think one, very dangerous uh, situation is effectively what becomes ro racial profiling, profiling based on um, taking in characteristics of a person or a group and then assigning uh, conditional probabilities based on what is observed and coming to a conclusion of a probability of behavior or outcome that is not warranted but is based on a misapplication of the conditional probabilities. I think that uh, um, it, it's a sort of thing where, you know, you, we've heard many, many instances of, uh, of um, you know, I saw this person, this person had a hoodie, this person was young, uh, therefore this person was a threat, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get into very sensitive territory, but I, I, I get. I, I think it's. Um, I think probability, understanding probability, is uh, difficult and dangerously difficult, and I think it is quite often misapplied in situations that can result in false conclusions, unwarranted conclusions, because of false assumptions. Are you referring to someone like Karen Lums? talk and Karen Lum's work on um, police work and kind of finding areas where policemen should look as opposed to where crimes actually occur. Have you seen her talk? No, I haven't seen her talk. I mean, what there are many, many recent examples, but I'm thinking there's this news story that came out of Florida a couple weeks ago about how the police department was taking um, citizens or residents and categorizing them based on 
certain characteristics and identifying them as potentially threats to public safety and then harassing them. Okay, now there are all kinds of things wrong with that, obviously, but the, the sort of, you know, people can refer back to the movie Minority Report, but the idea that you can take probabilities and stack them up and reach a conclusion that you feel is 99.9% .9 warranted when in fact your assumptions are very weak. Uh, and um, I mean, it, it's, it's a part, it is a part of being human. Uh, there's a the really interesting book by Dan, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow where he talks about when we need to make a quick decision about a situation, we're often applying a Bayesian type of thinking. Okay, given what I see here, what do I think is going on? Uh, what is the probability, you know, whatever. I mean, the, we, we, we think of the old stories, the old, uh, like, um, well, I think it's outdated now, but when I was young, there was the old uh, riddle about the um, father and son in a car accident and uh, the son is rushed to the hospital and the doctor says, I can't operate on this, this person, he's my son. You know, it's like, well, the doctor is a woman. Of course the doctor is a woman, but back then it was kind of like, what, what? The doctor can't be a woman. How could the doctor be a woman? And it was this sort of, you know, the assumption that you're making that made that riddle kind of work then, unfortunately it doesn't really work very well now, but still that sort of, I made an assumption about what is going on in this riddle based on my preconception about frequencies, about Bayesian frequencies. And I was proved to be wrong in a surprising way. And that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to get at is, is all throughout li you know, life, we are making assumptions that sometimes we have to examine our assumptions. And the whole idea of this thinking fast and slow is that often our fast decision is inaccurate. It's necessary, but inaccurate. And when we think more slowly, and analyze, we often can see where we've made a mistake. If I could jump in just for a second, um, I'll put the link to Karen Lum's talk um, on, I guess, this, uh, this channel. But basically to summarize it into like two sentences, if I can, is basically she looked at police records and she was working with Oakland Police Department, which is in San Francisco Bay Area. And basically she found, or the police department found that crimes were happening, happening in poor areas. So the upshot of that was that Oakland police put more resources into the poorer areas to find crime. Well, if you put more resources into the poor areas, you're gonna find more crime. But what about the crimes that occurred, you know, in the rich areas, they go unsolved, they go uncaught. So it's kind of a, an interesting way to look at things basically you know, there's programs that police use nowadays, actually, to predict where trouble should be, just like the sort of search, um, search algorithm that I discussed. Um, another thing that I just wanted to mention very carefully is, um, very quickly, excuse me, is um, he talked about spam filters. Spam filters, if anyone's looked at those, they're really cool to look at. And, and you could put together, you know, a really quick talk on spam filters just the basics because they use Bayesian straight out of the box and the simplest ones are just really you know elegant to look at and that might be worth you know someone talking about maybe I'm pointing my finger at myself but you know that those are really you know that's a really good thing to look at for a data science person basically you know how to do spam filters and how to how to reject spam how to you know or, or when to keep it so um Two cents. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry, I don't. I don't want to dominate the conversation. But another way in which uh, Bayesian probabilities have really been on my mind in recent months is with trying to interpret the data from the pandemic, and specifically, uh, we get raw numbers of um, tests and positives uh, and, and negatives, but a lot of those numbers are based on conditional probabilities and they cannot be treated as gospel. I mean, for example, I live in Mexico. In Mexico, testing is much, occurs at a much lower level than it does, for example, in the US or many EU countries. Uh, so we have a much higher rate of positive tests per test. The reason is that it's expensive to do the test and generally people are not tested unless they're thought to be at risk. Whereas in the United States, 
Um, I, the number of tests has been in the millions. Um, and uh, so when people say, oh, the incidence is higher here in the city, but lower in the, in the rural areas, since March, I've been saying, you gotta, you've got to uh, uh, test your assumptions. You've got you've to be explicit about your assumptions because testing is not the same everywhere. Self-reporting is not the same everywhere. So what you think is happening is only a shadow of what is likely to be happening. And unless you recognize that, you're going to make very poor public, public health decisions. And unfortunately, the last six months to me has just been a, a complete, um, I won't use the, the nasty word I wasn't thinking of, but a complete mess of bad public health and policy decisions based on misapplication of, of, uh, of probability. And Matt asks the question, how many people have been here been tested for COVID? I have not been tested for COVID. Uh, um, like I said- Has anyone it, else it, been tested? Just out of curiosity. How many people here? I've been tested four here? times. Four, that's Josh? Yeah. You've been tested four times? Yeah, uh, well, I, I was in Canada. So, I mean, it's very easy to get tested. Oh, did you, are you positive? Were you positive in any one of those? No, but I was like uh, in a larger bubble, a couple, like, last weekend and so I got tested on Monday of this week and got my results back on Wednesday no and kidding. All, all negative tests but it's interesting because like the false negative rate on those could be actually quite high so you, you could have yeah. come back positive the false yeah. positives sure but sure. Massachusetts rules are that one negative test and I'm free to do whatever I want so it's actually interesting because this application of Bayes rule would say that I have a non-zero probability of being positive for COVID, given my prior knowledge of my activity, uh, even though I have one negative test result. How easy was it to get tested in Canada, by the way? Uh, I just called and set up an appointment and then uh, they like on one day's notice you show up and there's no wait and you do a drive-through. A drive-through, right, right. Yeah. Has anyone else been tested? If I wanted to te be tested in Mexico, it cost me about $170. Hmm. Yeah, and by the I, way, I, 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 so uh, um, I'm in, I was working molecular biology. I know how to run an RT-PCR, which is the essence of a test. Um, the, the thing I don't really have experience with is doing the swabbing and, and working with the PPE. But in terms of the actual uh, RT-PCR, that's a common lab technique. And one thing I can tell you is that RT-PCR is extraordinarily sensitive to contamination. Yes. And when I saw labs uh, saying, oh, we had a false positive, of course you had false positives. False, false positives are inherent in PCR, unless, you, unless you, you're using really good lab techniques, and I suspect a lot of people are not. Yeah, I, I've been tested once, and they basically, I was joking with someone, they tickled my brain. You know, you put your head back and they, they put that swab way up there and, you know, in your sinus cavities. It's not fun. You know, your, your eyes are watering and you're like coughing and they're just, they're just, you know, kind of smiling and, you know, that's it. Um, interesting though. Thanks, Josh. Josh. Yeah, it's not comfortable at all. By the fourth time, I wasn't flinching, but it definitely was, uh, doesn't get easier. <laughs> Yeah. 